So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Michael Faraday, uh, who was uh, born uh, just south of London, but moved to London for most, so he was actually in London for most of his life. I've chosen him as my favourite scientist, just because he seems to have done so much work that's really revolutionised what we do day to day, but so few people actually know about his real true discoveries. Um, and so I wanted to talk about him and a little bit of his life and how he came to, to get to where he was. So he worked a lot between uh, the interaction between electric and magnetic fields, uh, particularly in uh, conductors like wires, um, and how you could use the electricity flowing through a wire to make a magnetic field, um, which is something that we use a lot. It, it's in almost everything. If he hadn't done the work that he'd done, we wouldn't be anywhere near as advanced probably with almost everything that runs on electricity. So that's the thing that most people know him for. Um, but there are lots of things that we don't know him for and what I really like about him is his charisma and the way that he presented his work. He was a real good what we'd call nowadays a networker I guess um, and people don't sort of appreciate it. You'd think of scientists back in the 1800s of sitting at their desks scrolling away with a quill just trying to, to just write down what they're doing but he was really out there talking to people, networking, building these great relationships with scientists that were around in the same sort of time um, and that's really how he got to do all of the work which he did. He was born into a poor family but he apprenticed as a bookmaker and so he read through all of the books and he really knew that he wanted to sort of look into these academic type of things and so he started to go to lectures um, at people's houses. People would hold a, an open lecture which you'd pay for. He borrowed some money, went along to the lecture, really liked it and so he'd talk to the scientists. His big famous connection was with Davy, who was a big um, sort of physical chemist of the time. And in actuality, he produced notes. Every time he went to a lecture, he made these fantastic notes. And he bound the notes and presented them to Davy at the end of his lectures. And it sort of formed uh, a, a really good working life for him. So he was kind of sucking up to him. Absolutely, completely sucking up. Um, but it worked, it paid off. Um, and he actually ended up working in Davy's lab for quite some time. He struggled for a bit, he worked as a lab assistant um, for Davy. he did lots of experiments, he was big into making things go bang at the time, not necessarily intentionally, but Davy actually had quite a serious accident and for a while he lost his sight as a result of one of the explosions. And so Faraday, because he'd built up this great relationship, actually worked as a scribe for Davy for quite some time. And that really sort of helped push him forward and that got him into the Royal Institution, the Royal Society, which then allowed him to meet sort of more important scientists and all of the time he's sort of discussing science with him he was a really prolific letter writer and what's really great I think one of the best things really is he was really bad at maths <laughs> so all through this he's making these brilliant discoveries and he just looks at what's happening makes notes tries different things systematically goes through all of the different ways he could change it but never goes, oh, this is the equation that's going to solve this. He left that to people who were really good at maths. I'm a true experimentalist, again, a bit afraid of uh, some of the maths that lies behind it. And a lot of the time nowadays, we tend to get bogged down with it. So you'll come up with a problem, you'll see something, and it'll be really important that you understand an equation that underlies it. And sometimes it almost takes away from the true nature of the discovery and how useful it is to, to the work that people are doing. But I'm not saying he just sort of skirted over it and he went, wow, this is really interesting. Now someone else deal with it. He really went into depth. He really understood what was going on. He looked so completely at the processes and made fantastic notes, published really quality papers, but in a way that is almost accessible to everybody. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of science in there, but within sort of a little bit of reading, you can really understand what he did, why he did it, and do it yourself. So he worked a lot to start with um, on quite a few optics things, and again with this electric and magnetic field. Um, but he actually discovered, although he didn't realise when he first discovered it, um, a certain type of glass which he'd made, and when you put it in a magnetic field, it changes the way the light moves through it. And so he, he didn't really know why that was clever. He, he saw what was happening, he did some experiments, and it was really good. But now it's in so many laser systems that are in everybody's lab, and people just take it for granted. So that was his sort of first real key discovery that feeds into it, and again, that's called the Faraday effect. Then he went on and did a bit more sort of chemistry stuff, um, which is really interesting. And in actuality, I didn't realise 
But back in the 1800s, he was working on the properties of nanoparticles. So we think of nano as this really trendy new science. But he realized that tiny particles of gold that have a nanometer diameter, so a, um, a tiny fraction of a meter, in a suspension of liquid didn't behave like a solid block of gold. Then he went back to physics again and this is where he really sort of did his key work on um, the interplay between electric fields and magnetic fields um, and again publications speaking to people really sort of getting it out there and that's what he became famous for I guess um, which is great it, it's it really is fantastic but then um, he went on to do some work which people had done previously but not very in depth I guess and he got a plate uh, like a dish um, but quite flat which he vibrated with a violin bow so just playing it effectively along the side and so he made it vibrate up and down and if you put little tiny particles like salt or um, he used lycopodium powder quite a bit which is like a, a natural tiny tiny particle powder when you put it on and vibrate it depending on the frequency how many times it goes up and down per second you'd get these different patterns forming on the top of the tray so lots of people had done it, there were some interesting publications already, but he really took it and ran with it almost and really wanted to understand exactly what was going on. And he tried changing different things, he changed the size of the plate, how he applied the vibration, how many different frequencies he looked at, the different powders, the sizes of the powders. And in the end he comes up with this fantastic 40 page publication and the language in it is just fantastic, I'll read you an excerpt in a little while. The beautiful series of forms assumed by sand filings or other grains when lying upon vibrating plates is so striking as to be recalled to the minds of those who have seen them at the slightest reference. And I just think it's a really, it just really sort of typifies his language and how nicely it's all written and presented. Are your papers like that? I wish they were. <laughs> and so this was a presentation which he made at the Royal Society. But then halfway through, once he'd already sort of submitted his presentation, he found that you can do the same with liquids. Okay, so this is um, a little demo which I've set up of Faraday waves. So we've got some water which has been tainted with ink. But I'm just going to start now at a low frequency and we'll see that we start off with the sort of typical pattern and then it just destabilizes into these crispations. So we've got four sort of square shapes now dancing around in the dish. And as we increase the frequency, we get more and more of these form in the dish. And some of them particularly around here actually physically force the liquid out of the tray and so you can see now there's loads of these tiny little towers almost moving around in the dish and one of his sort of major discoveries was the fact that regardless of the the size of the dish these are dependent on the thickness of the liquid um, sort of depth of the liquid and the frequency that you're vibrating them at, but nothing else. I mean, I'm quite application driven in what I do day to day, but from time to time you stumble across something that's really cool just for the sake of being cool almost. But more and more nowadays we're driven to sort of make things to make money or make things because someone needs it. And it's really quite nice that for possibly not for very much longer, we're still able to do things for the sake of science almost. Mm -hmm.